And, and next up is Eva Woisbun. So a little introduction for Eva. So Eva is a, an assistant professor at Ryerson University's School of Professional Communication, and she has a doctorate in communication and culture also from Ryerson University. And although we did not schedule this deliberately, at, she also happens to be Professor Nessel Roth's daughter. Um, I asked her before I introduced her whether she was okay with me uh, outing that relationship and she says she's now now that she's no longer a teenager she's happy to acknowledge the relationship so please please welcome Eva oh and I'm sorry and her paper is the digital abject or the grotesque realities of e-waste and their inherent power as visual trope please welcome Eva Thank you. Um, if my father's talk was inspirational and intellectual, I hope that mine is repulsive and disgusting. Uh, I hope that you, I'm glad that you've eaten already because I would not want to do this uh, before lunch. So I'm from Toronto, so welcome to my home. I was born and raised here. Uh, and home is a really important notion to, to most of us. So when we think of home, we think of a private place where we feel comfortable and safe and we feel surrounded by family and our belongings. As Dorothy says in The Wizard of Oz, there is no place like home. Home may also be embroiled in our sense of identity and, uh, and its complicated dimensions of identity of ourself versus our family, of our origins, which we may embrace or deny, and of ourself in the world. So regardless of our sense of, uh, our complicated sense of ourselves in relation to whatever place it is that we call home, Home is a highly romanticized trope in the West. It's full of connotations of comfort, safety, nostalgia, a return to one's roots. Home, however, is indeed the place where we live, voluntarily or otherwise, where our life unfolds, and where we are physically bound in space and time to a given place, whether that is a uptown condo uh, or the garbage dump. So our sense of home and homeliness or the sense of familiarity we would derive from our home space often idealizes uh, living and family space as one that is protected from the world's ills. So think of the last IKEA catalog that arrived on your doorstep, and the images in that catalog present home as a place of fun and family, cleanliness, organization, and of a kind of sanctuary from the world outside. In the West, home is a sanctuary, particularly to be alone and to block out undesired elements of the world. But what do we make of the home in the e-waste dump? So this is a picture from uh, Akragana, where the house itself and the life that occurs within it are embedded in the detritus of the digital age. In his 1919 essay, The Uncanny, uh, Freud explains a kind of fear, which he describes as a fear of the uncanny, or that which is familiar, but just slightly off in some way to make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. The uncanny is the site of something recognizable, like a home, like one's childhood home in particular, but it's changed in such a way as to be a little bit uh, fearsome and repulsive. In German, this is called the unheimlich or the unhomely. So for here, for example, we recognize that this is this man's home, but it makes us uncomfortable. We recognize that it's made of styrofoam blocks, probably from refrigerators and computer parts, and he lives and works amidst uh, e-waste. The unheimlich is oops, unsettling, and it's eerie similarity to what we know, and at the same time, lugubrious or gloomy, miserable, and woebegone. Fear of the uncanny is a bourgeois fear, particularly. It's entwined in Western notions of intimacy, repulsion, and anxiety. But there's tremendous power in the unheimlich, a power that can be productive in ways that other forms of discourse fail to meet. In many parts of the world, such as Guayu, China, and parts of India, and Agba Bloshi, Ghana, people live and work amidst the world's largest electronic waste dump sites. Families live and work and raise their children in these sites. They make a living dismantling and stripping down electronics, uh, essentially the world's <coughs> digital rubbish, e-waste that has been shipped predominantly from the US, Canada, and Europe, despite international laws prohibiting the export of such a waste. In these sites, there are often no boundaries between the home and the refuse pile. They are essentially one and the same. Everything from keyboards, monitors, circuits, cell phones, tablets, and printers are dismantled by hand. 
wires are burned and stripped for their copper, and memory boards are bathed in acid and uh, stripped away all the unwanted materials to get at the precious metals inside, and plastics are burned and melted, and the spent acidic wastewater is often dumped into the ground or into local rivers. So here, uh, there's a river that runs through Guayu, and um, acidic wastewater is just dumped into the river. So within a few short years of the rise of e-waste recycling, the water in Guayu's main river is too toxic for irrigation. It used to be an agricultural town, uh, and now is not uh, so much anymore. The water is unfit for drinking, for cooking, and you can't even wash your clothes in it without bearing a significant uh, health risk. In Guayu, then, the entire landscape of the city has been reshaped by e-waste, rendering the, the whole town unheimlich. We look upon images of chemical cesspools and digital remains, and our disgust forces us to acknowledge that the waste, the filth, is actually ours. The images fracture the lure of the shiny new digital device, and they expose the harsh realities of the material basis of our digital tools. These photos reveal a grotesque explosion of digital innards. It is the unheimlich face of the digital age. Stephanie Walsh Matthews suggests that robots and their computational facades have always triggered feelings of repulsion because of their uncanny, not quite human expression, which she calls the gross boutique. In these images, we recognize a few remaining familiar parts of our own devices. What you're seeing might be your old cell phone or your old printer that you threw away 10 years ago. It's all there. It's our waste, and we can't deny the familiarity of the objects that we see or of the rubbish. In the moment of recognition, triggers a feeling of shame, guilt, embarrassment, and, some, and, and hopefully a sense of urgency. But the e-waste problem has given rise to a new kind of photographic power. A proliferation of photo essays, galleries, and independent films uh, are now available on the internet that bring awareness and concern to the issue. We can finally see what has been concealed behind a rhetoric of recycling and donation campaigns. The photos are shocking and horrific. The swirls of black smoke indicate that these are smoldering piles of burning synthetics. Piles of discarded and unsalvageable remains line riverbanks and congest what used to be marshland, and children play among broken circuit boards and tangles of wires, situations we would probably not let our own children play in because they're too dangerous. So photos of e-waste are the new abject and monstrous image of our time, to use Julia Fristeva's term. The growing piles of e-waste remind us, however uncomfortably we may feel, that our fetish for ever new digital devices leave a trail of detritus behind. Our digital remains do not disintegrate. The remains become problematic, and images of this growing pile of waste evoke feelings of disgust, shame, guilt, and abjection. In her 1982 essay, Powers of Horror, an essay on objection, Kristeva explores the visceral reaction we have when faced with something that is disgusting to the point of revulsion. The abject, she argues, is something repulsive yet alluring, and imagine an, uh, an image that triggers a gut reaction of disgust, like a corpse rotting, swarming with maggots, for example. It may be repulsive, but we can't tear our eyes away from it. There's something familiar in that object. So the abject thing hovers on the line between subject and object. It's cast outside the, boun the boundaries of objectivity. She calls this the jettisoned object, which is really fitting in this case. It's radically excluded and pulls us towards a place where meaning collapses. This is our digital age. This is what we've created. So repugnance and disgust protect us from the shame and acknowledgement that the abject is, or was once, part of us. So we look upon images of chemical cesspools and digital remains, and our disgust allows us a moment that shelters us from the truth and shame that comes from acknowledging that it's our doing. The images fracture the lure of the shiny new digital object, and they expose a material basis behind our most ubiquitous tools, tools that we have been sold are immaterial, or that should be smaller and more wireless. There is a material reality and cost to pay for um, miniaturization. So the photos reveal a grotesque explosion of innards. They're computers at their most unheimlich. The grotesqueness of these images, like the abject, induce a powerful polarizing emotional response, as, Mo as Walsh Matthews argues. Such attraction and revulsion, empathy and aversion, and so forth. Our experience of the grotesqueness of e-waste, mediated here photographically, could be a symptom of our decline as a society clearly pointing to our instinctive desire to survive our own creation despite the filth and garbage. 
The disgust we feel when we look at these images, Christie would argue, are a symptom of a sign of objection. That moment of disgust transports us outside of our consciousness and into the realm of visceral reactions. We have a, a gut feeling. It, may, it turns our stomach a bit. And that's a very powerful emotional response that we can tap into. We fear the abject because it reminds us of our own subjectivity. We see ourselves in that mess. We see that it's our stuff. We fear our own creation and its ability to pollute, destroy, and engulf us. We ultimately fear ourselves and our own desires for more digital objects, which will inevitably end up uh, here or in someone else's home, from our home to theirs in a transformed state. In addition, the multitude and magnitude of the heaps of eroding e-waste serve to further the abject nature of the images, of the, of the objects. Some things are made more filthy and fearsome simply by their multiplicity. To give you an example, a single fly in the room doesn't really bother you, but a swarm of flies starts to feel a bit disgusting. So when we look at pit piles of e-waste and hundreds and thousands of monitors and wires, the multiplicity of it is very moving. So Kristeva argues that this is the primal repulsion, first experienced in infancy as a baby, as a baby turns its head away from its mother and finds its, bo its mother's bodily effluence repulsive. That serves to delineate the boundaries between mother and child. That little bit of disgust is what helps create subjectivity. So later in life, we continue to recoil when confronted with uh, objects that are object to us. So when we look at this kind of filth, it threatens our sense of self and safety. Kristeva explores the notion of abjection from a psychoanalytic point of view as a means of delineating subjectivity and of grappling with the unique nature of the abject. She argues that a sense of oneself arises out of a confrontation with the abject. And that's where I feel the images of e-waste are at their most powerful. I think that we can, we can extract her notion and its emphasis not on disgust, but also on self-awareness and shame to use it productively in the context of e-waste. So one of the problems surrounding e-waste and our habits, uh, are, are habits of consumption is most typically framed as an environmental concern, which of course it is. But the impact, impacts of e-waste e are described in terms of chemicals and in stats and numbers. But I think that the power of the photograph is much more powerful than environmental rhetoric alone. I argue that we need to leverage the power of the horror of the mess we have created in order to motivate consumers to change some of their habits. So here's a, a, an image from the Basel Action Network, which is a collection of uh, photos and uh, videos that f photojournalists have submitted, um, and where you can really get a sense of the, the visual power of these images. So photos of e-waste are the new abject and monstrous images of our time. The growing piles remind us that our fetish for the new leave a trail of detritus behind. Their remains become problematic and they evoke feelings of disgust, but we need to tap into that power because it's enormously powerful. So the e-waste dump site it is an unheimlich inversion of the digital age. The e-waste home is made of memory, that is, hardware, literally, uh, just to go back to show you. These people's homes are actually made of our old memories and our memory boards. The e-waste dweller lives amidst the ruins of memory while creating their own memories of family life. The images are on Heimlich in the classic sense of the word, bearing the gloominess of digital ghosts, dead cell phones, irretrievable data, and trails of wires. So ultimately, project, my project seeks to call attention to the e-waste issue secondarily, but primarily to the power of the image of the e-waste particularly in the context of home, as a means to amplify and balance the environmental rhetoric surrounding this crisis. Whereas environmental rhetoric relies on scientific quantification and data, the image specifically that of the home amidst admis e-waste is a powerful tool and stands out as proof of our destructive habits and our general denial of material impacts of the digital age. So here, if you're uh, interested in further reading later, each of these sites has done uh, sort of a photojournal essay or a series of videos on e-waste that are remarkably powerful. However, there's still a lot of work to be done, and none of these images have really carried uh, into the social media sphere um, as of yet. And I have some final thoughts. Don't be afraid of the grotesque, right? The feelings you feel when you look at those images are powerful, and there's a lot to be gained there. It's very motivating. 
I think it's important to render the invisible visible to show what others would rather hide. And images of emails do that. They make us confront what we try to hide under a veneer of digital uh, technology. And the uncanny leaves a lasting impression. It has a deep resonance within us. The uncanny shows ourself at our worst, and it's a very productive tool. Um, but I don't want to be a downer, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to end there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going <laughs> to. The medium is the message indeed. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions? We have time for one. Thierry. Hi, just one question. How do you get the, the object uh, to turn into apathy? Into apathy? Yeah. Uh, well, this is the, the next stage. So this is a part of a larger project that I'm working on, is to make that happen. And I think that social media is a powerful tool that needs to be leveraged in this context, because we've seen other campaigns, particularly around endangered species and wildlife, that has gained tremendous traction through social media. And I think there's an opportunity here to bring that to people in a, in a format, sort of like the meme, to, to make it a meme so that people recognize it. It's beginning to happen. You see it a little bit with fix-it movements for digital tools. Um, but I think there needs to be greater awareness. And I think there's also an act of suppression of the reality of e-waste by companies like Apple to really actively deny uh, some of these realities. And I think it just it needs greater exposure. Yeah, actually. Uh, what? I understand that the social media is going to be great for those who are already behind this project and who are already aware of it. But those that have already gone into the apathy mm -hmm. of seeing these kind of images, the larger masses who, who, who don't care anymore, you can show them the picture but it doesn't affect them anymore. How, how can you counter that if you keep on showing them more and more <coughs> and more? Why not one image, one good one? Ah, <laughs> it would be important. I think if we could find the magical image that would speak to everyone. For me personally, I think the framing of home is really, in some ways, more powerful than just a pile of waste because it shows that this is where people live. And if you could imagine that this is your own home um, and that your clean, digitized, smart home comes at a cost of the dirty e-waste home at its geographical antipode at the other side. The question, the magical question always is, how do you motivate people to change? And I think, I think people need to recognize what happens to that phone that you plunk into the environmental waste recycling bin, is that many of them will end up here, despite our best intentions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.